Good evening, everybody. You're here with the Embroidery Nerd. I'm Justin Armento with JA Digitizing Studios. We have Mike Maldoni. Uh, no, I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> and DJ Anderson from Digitizing Mesh Class is joining us tonight. So uh, we're going to have a, uh, a needle bar discussion on a digi uh, digitizing 911. Uh, so we, we're going to review a, a design that a uh, a group member had posted earlier this week that they're having some difficulties with on an unconstructed hat. So we're just going to kind of go over the design, how it was originally, what I did to change, and help her out with it sewing correctly on the hat that she was using. So I am going to go here and check out a couple comments. We got Cindy King. Hey, Cindy. Hey, Cindy. What's happening? Ramona, Hello, Ramona. from Cold, Illinois. I wish it was cold here. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, Scott checking in from Sunrise Tactical Greer. And who else we have here? We have a bunch of hellos back and forth. We have uh, a Letty is here. We've got Jesse. <clears throat> All right. So, um, awesome. like I said, we uh, we had a post in the group, and of course. We try to do our best, you know, if, if not one of us, you know, people in the group try to answer questions as much as possible. Um, but whenever I see a, a design issue that I think might be in the digitizing, I do always uh, try to offer up looking at the design. And if I think there's something that needs to be or can be improved in order to just work in general or work on a specific garment that they're having problems with. Cause I think if I remember correctly, originally this one, um, this design was used prior and it worked fine, but going on these particular hats, the design wasn't working too well. So, uh, if one of you don't mind, cause I'm going to be switching back and forth with my Wocom. If you guys see any questions, just shout at me. Yeah. We'll call you All up right. for sure. All right, so this is the um, this is the design itself, the original design, the picture that she had posted. So it is on an unconstructed hat, um, and the problems they were having were the registration problems. So you can see, like in here, the silver part of the boat was lining up at the top and on the sides. Down below here, uh, you got some red peeking out down at the bottom, and uh, some white in the teeth popping out. So overall. Um, the the general look of the the design um, was just kind of shifting around, which can be a problem with with unconstructed hats. Um, they're not fun to work with, especially with the designs that have quite a bit of fill area. Because um, basically, that even though you know the general go to answers that I I actually saw in the group were making sure that it was uh, hooped properly. It's hooped tightly, um, but sometimes, especially depending on what hat hoop you have and what machine you have, there's only so much you can do when it comes to the, the hooping. Yeah. Um, a couple of different tricks as far as stabilizer. Um, sometimes we go to two pieces of stabilizer to kind of really stabilize that surface, kind of give it a nice rigid surface to work on. Uh, another <clears throat> suggestion that I saw that was actually a really good suggestion that I always forget about this one, but I... I, I have seen it work is actually adding some spray tack uh, to the stabilizer and that way that material of the hats get a kind of stick in place and it's not going to shift as much. So I'm not too sure if those suggestions went along with the file that I gave the individual, but um, it did end up actually working for her in the end. So whatever it is she did with, with my file, it did work out for her. So awesome. Going uh going post to post with a stabilizer helps also. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, <laughs> a lot of people might think you know, say on stabilizer, if the design is only two inches wide, they may cut a piece that's only three inches wide. Um, but you want that stabilizer not only the hat, you want it pretty much secure all yeah. the way around in that hoop. The stabilizer, um, you really want a good amount of that being caught up in the hoop as well. So yeah, and it's eighty three percent of our normal work. It's fine to just use the the minimum amount of stabilizer on a on a structured hat but anytime you're getting into these uh unstructured or uh into some of the really crazy stuff where you really need a nice solid base like like multi-layer foam and all that other kind of 
like adventurous activity. Um, <laughs> post to post really helps because now your stabilizer is held on three sides, not just one. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. So we have Charlotte checking in here. This is actually the, the group member that posted it. Um, ah. She did use only one stabilizer and did not use the spray adhesive. So that's actually good news. I'm glad that the uh, the design worked out better for you then. So Yeah, that um, is minimal materials means more production efficiency. So. Exactly. I, and and that's, that's kind of my point of view in, in, in production, of course. I always say start with your basics, your basic knowledge. Um, the run-of-the-mill stuff that's that's common knowledge throughout the industry it's there for a reason people have been using it for years and years and years it's been pretty pretty proven uh to work depending on if people are talking about hats or shirts whatever it may be placements um stabilizers so i always say rule of thumb is to definitely start with what's commonly used from there if you're still having problems like if, if it's a specific garment that you're having problems with um, just a unique situation, then you might start getting into mixing stabilizers, using an adhesive stabilizer, whatever it may be. Um, but less is more when it comes to production, less time you're trying to add time and hooping, time in on the machine, whatever it may be. If it's not necessary, I say try to skip it. So, yeah, it's a combination of things, right? It's a uh, digitizing and also the stabilizer because like especially with these unstructured hats because they you always have to remember when you're trying to stabilize a hat in a hoop of a hat the cap um, frame it does the the fabric is separate from the stabilizer so right. the fabric can still move and shift and the stabilizer could stay right where it is the problem comes in the shifting of the fabric right and that can be digitizing from the right starting point and working your way out. Or it could be just, you know, using a little bit of spray adhesive because mm -hmm. that's going to hold the fabric. It's going to at least keep it from shifting. But if you digitize it a certain way, which she obviously had success, you can get away with not having to do that. But if you're ever right. not, if you're one of those people that can't edit the design, you might want to start with spray adhesive on an unstructured hat. Right. Yes, exactly. Um, and for those that don't know, just in case you are kind of new to the industry, as far as the terminology of these hats, um, the structure of the hat, the uh, a structured hat's going to have buckram behind the, the front of the crown. So they have that structure to it. There's, there's a thickness to it. There's a rigidity to it. Um, an unconstructed hat's not going to have that bumper buck room in the back. So that, that material is just, you can push it and pull it every way. It's, it's just a, a floppy hat. They also call them. Um, right. You have terms like um, the, the crown height. Um, there's different terminology, uh, high profile, low profile, mid profiles. Um, that's just going to be the actual height of, of how long, how tall it stands off your head. So you may have, a hat that's high profile, low profile, mid profile, and those still can be can be structured. Um, yeah. But typically, when you have an unstructured hat, that's usually a low profile because what it does right. is when you put it on, it kind of just it goes with your the shape of your head. It kind of pulls yeah. back with it. So yeah, you're kind of fighting against all the worst possible scenarios. Yeah, when exactly. you're dealing with an unstructured hat. The exactly. only the only things I know of that that kind of take all of that out of, out of place are the 30 year old wide frames that uh that certainly tajima used to make i don't i don't know if any of the other brands had them but but they were basically a window yes clamped down the front of those unstructured hats uh -huh. completely so you're you're solid on all four sides so as long as you get a little bit of tug in there and and get it hooped firmly those things work great but they also mm -hmm. stopped making them 30 years ago exactly so. yeah yeah that's it's it's again one of those things where you you can you can experiment with clamping down things, and I've seen some some crazy contraptions when people need to clamp down things. But mm -hmm. you you start limiting your sewing area and stuff like that. Again, it, especially if you're in in production and you're trying to get a, a bigger job done, you don't want to worry about all these extra bells and whistles when you are just trying to get in on and off the machine and get your production going. So, mm -hmm. uh, then you did make common here. Does anyone order from auto caps they started sending a real thin stabilizer <laughs> yes i have actually seen that recently um 
we don't use that stabilizer when we get it. So yeah, a, a good quality, yeah, a good quality stabilizer that's meant for hats is definitely yeah. a, a must when you're running hats. Yeah, I have thrown every piece of stabilizer Auto has ever sent me in the trash. It yeah. is worthless. I mean, it's 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 cool that they're trying to help their customers, but yeah, yeah, it's yeah, but you know, giving something that's not going to work too well i think that kind of oh. defeats the purpose so. yeah toilet paper is about as useful <laughs> all right so let's uh let's take a look at the original file um so this is the original file as you can see that it's broken up into uh basically each one of the colors is done in its own color sequence so uh, when i'm approaching hats especially when there is a large fill area and especially on a an unconstructed hat, um, I'm always going to look at it where I need to break up the design. Because um, basically, if, if you're trying to sew, like, for instance, the the blue areas of this of this design, um, if you're trying to sew kind of the whole area first, and then try to come back and do all these smaller elements, by the time you sew that whole area, and that cap is already starting to shift, and then you're trying to do all, all the elements together, you're like all the fill areas, then come back and do the outlines. By the time it does the outlines, <clears throat> especially in pretty much the, the entire area from top to bottom of the design, that hat's going to shift quite a bit. Um, and that's where you get your registration problem. So uh, if I were to get this design, I would Im immediately start analyzing and saying, OK, where should I break it up? I, I need to kind of do a section border it, do a section, border it. So it is kind of focused only on, on smaller areas. So you're not kind of going fully one way back and, and back and forth like that. So uh, let's do a quick sew through. So right off the bat, I did see that the design really isn't work, uh, sewing from center out. It's starting here on the left-hand side so start in this fill area. Um, and not only that, it's, again, a, a larger fill area. I try to make sure that there is a, a global underlay. So what that's going to do is kind of, it's a, it's a loose, either running stitch or a loose fill that I cover throughout the, the design. And that stabilizes the whole area. Make sure that that hat is surly, uh, securely secured to that, that stabilizer. So hopefully you're, your movement on that material is going to be minimal. Do you make um, that your first, like um, the color of the hat, or do you? It it depends. On this particular one, I believe I'm going to look at my file right now. But I believe I did suggest to her to to um, use the color of her hat. Um, if, no, Cindy, this I, is the original file. Sorry. Oh yeah, uh, this yeah, this is the original file. So I I do try to use the first color uh, sequence or the first color in the in the design only to save a color change um, but there you know if the global the global underlay underlay is going to be uh, underneath all the top colors so if I know that there's going to be the first color is going to be a, a darker color or something that's really really bright like red and the top colors are going to be lighter like white or silver or something like that there's potential where you're going to see that that high contrast showing through the top stitches. So if that is the case, then I do suggest using that that first global underlay, something as close as possible to the to the hat color, and that way it's kind of hidden underneath. Yep. So like I said, the uh, looks like the the boat tank character here was uh, first to fill. Then it comes back and does the fill of the yeah. top section, which in in theory, if it, it is kind of going by the theory of, of bottom to top, but again, it, it started on the left-hand side. So not only are you not really stabilizing that, that hat to your, to your stabilizer, but now from starting left to right, you're kind of pushing the material that way as well. When you're when you're sewing from uh, from go from one side to the other, you're gonna start pushing that material out one way. Which uh, in shapes like circles, something that is symmetrical, if you are doing that, 
you're going to end up looking like you have a, an egg or an oval because you are pushing up one direction so much. Oh, uh, there's, there's a trim in there I didn't like. There, this is all <laughs> over the place. Oh. So yeah, so so again, this this uh, the design originally um, was kind of all the fill colors first, uh, the the small little detail colors like the eyes and the teeth, and then it's going to try to come back and do all the detail as far as the the black outline. So at this point in sewing on your machine, you probably have this material pushing three different directions. Mm -hmm. So not only is it going to shift kind of to the right, and if I pause this just a moment, if you see here the 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 way it's off is kind of to the right the majority of where it's off you have that all yeah. your colors inside colors to the right because the fact that it was sewing left to right it was pushing that direction so just kind of shows you when you see registration problems off like that if you do see it's it's the majority of where it's off is all one direction then you you kind of have to make sure that the design it's stabilized so it's not going to push that direction yeah so yeah it's just finishing off the uh the outline here and again the the direction of the outline is is pretty much goes by uh what you should do it started at the bottom worked your way up so um yeah. the the rule of thumb, just in case uh, people don't know but rule of thumb in digitizing for hats is to digitize center out bottom to top so yeah this uh, this isn't exactly a, a cakewalk in the first place um there's a, all these little tiny satins and and stuff this, this is a lot to manage yeah yeah even absolutely. under ideal circumstances so yeah um and again i i'm pretty sure that charlotte mentioned that she she did use this design i don't know if it was on a, a, a structured hat last time or if it was on a flat um, but yeah, the, the way it's digitized, it very well could work on a flat, depending on the material. Mm -hmm. And if you are using the right stabilizer and, and hooping tightly. Um, but a lot of times, uh, the issue of taking a design that was digitized specifically for a shirt and taking it to a hat, whether it's uh, unconstructed or not, you may have these issues. So. Mm -hmm. Let me see here. So, okay. so we uh, we established we have the it's it's kind of going bottom to top, but it isn't going uh, center out. So you are having the pushing to the right uh, when it sews the the fill of the boat little character. So let me pull up my design here. So yeah, Charlotte said she did it on a flat and it worked out perfectly, which makes right. perfect sense because yeah. a chunk of fabric and stabilizer hooped all the way around in a standard frame. Exactly. You know, yeah. It's, Here, it's not such yeah. a big design that it's going to move stuff around unless it's not held uh, solid. So, and like Mike was saying earlier, um, you look at a hoop that's that's used on a shirt, whether it's you know uh, a mighty hoop that has those really strong magnets, or you have a, a traditional hoop. That design is going to be surrounded in every side in in your hoop, so it's going to be secure on every side. <laughs> And unless you have those old school, uh, those windows that you hoop the hat and it completely top, bottom, left, right is 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 uh, clamped down. Uh, the majority of the newer hat hoops, they do only clamp down where the crown meets the bill. You have your clips that usually clip on the backside. Um, so those are the, the things that you're fighting against when you're running hats. So. Yeah. Uh, Let's see here. Yeah, there's some questions. What did the inside of the cap look like? I asked because I sew caps for the customers, sends them to Western store. Uh, it's a mess inside. I heat glue, heat gun the inside. Um, I don't know what the inside of this cap looked like, but I do know some people take the time to clean up um, the inside of caps. Yep. Particularly, we don't. Yeah. Um, if you, are going, <laughs> <laughs> if you are going to a retail source as far as selling it to the end customer at a retail store, I get why someone may want that kind of like, you know, bagging shirts individually, something like that. It's kind of yeah. a, an extra service that you might do for somebody yeah. 
whether you want to charge for an extra cleanup or, or it's just something you want to do to make sure that that particular hat is going to have that retail feel. feel. Yeah. Not to say that I haven't been out there and I grabbed stuff in the retail and things aren't trimmed. It's it's pretty bad sometimes. Yeah. So I use I use the backside of designs to kind of gauge the health of my file and my machine. Um, but beyond that, the inside's mine. I'm not I'm not doing any doing any yeah. severely extra work on there. Yeah, exactly. Um, I I use the backside like you said. Especially if, if an operator is coming to me saying like I'm having issues at this part of the design, a lot of times you can flip it over. Yeah. And if you're seeing some some really hard knotted areas, you know that's there's yeah. you know, maybe too many layers that are crossing over each other, so that it's too dense in those areas. Yeah, it's kind of the uh, the inside baseball thing where it's yep. if you know you know, and you're looking at the back of the head, yep. you're seeing you know even though the retail yep. person may be like, oh, what are all these these threads hanging off? Um, and yeah. again, that that depends on your machine and your trim lengths and, and stuff like that of how yeah. long your your tails are going to be in the bottom of that. So. Yeah. Even even if this file sews out cleanly, I would have expected to see a lot of you know potential almost bird nests with with all these narrow satins. Mm -hmm. it's not you're not going to be a lot of visible bobbin on those. Right. It's uh, that's another uh, almost gotcha on stuff like an unstructured hat because they're they can get sucked into that needle plate real quick. Uh, Sydney says she uses the heat gun. I know I've, I've seen people kind of use a, mm -hmm. a lighter. Uh, lighter takes care of it really quick, especially if they're using polyester thread. Kind of sucks up those little tails really quick. So yeah. Uh, Ramona says, uh, see, even with the guideline of bottom up and center out, I see where I would actually work. A global underlay, upper blue, top half, green, satins working top down. Lower green and lower blue satins. Yes. So, yeah. Ramona being a digitizer herself, I'm sure if <laughs> somebody gave us both this design, although it would have worked more than likely with one of us digitizing this or both of us digitizing it, I guarantee you, Ramona would have her style. I'd have my style. So, <laughs> it's not a one size fits all when it comes to how you digitize. But if you if you do recognize the issues that can be, and, and you do what you can to combat any of the issues and it's going to work for the end user. So, yeah. all right. So let's take a quick so, run through. Are you able to like show trim? Show trim? Yeah. Like where trims are. Is there like a command to view trim? Um, well, if you can see, they're kind of hard to see when you're in the wireframe. No, I was just kind of more curious if they were pathing to a lot of those smaller areas, which it looks like they were. So that's good. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So I was, uh, there is times where we, we do a digitizing 911 and the file is, is so bad that I would have to take the time to, by the time I edited everything that needed to be edited, I might as well just do it over. And there yeah. has been a few times it where it longer. takes longer to yeah. edit than it does to digitize. So. Exactly. So there's been times where, you know, Jeff and I both have looked at designs and, and he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to attack this and see the direction I'm going to go. You attack it. We, we completely redo the designs. I was able to use a lot of the elements here um, and just kind of change the color sequencing and added the global underlay and it worked. So it wasn't, cool. huh. again, I don't want to just, talk disparagingly against whoever digitized this originally. Um, it's, it's not like this is, I'm saying, oh, this is completely horrible. This is just taking a situation where. Um, no, and, and it probably worked on a structured hat possibly. Right. right. Not an exactly. So, I mean, there's, yeah. there's so many, like she obviously said that it worked fine on, on another item. So um, it's just modifying it for the job. Yeah. Right. And she she did also mention a few comments back that she did order it for a cap, mm -hmm. which uh, in 2023 that means structured 99.9 percent .9 of the time, right? So <clears throat> so yeah, no, I, I I wouldn't put any fault of this on the digitizer, honestly. Like it's no, uh, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, just a rule of thumb: these are the things that I would do no matter what kind of hat it is, and that and that's just the way. I view hat designs. Um, it doesn't hurt to do it for a unstructured hat. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, digitizing for an unstructured hat. 
It may add a little bit of stitches because you are going to add that global underlay, but it's minimal. minimal. And if it and if it yeah. really ensures that you're going to have a good sew, it's it's well worth it. I mean, I yeah. can, I can see if I was adding five thousand stitches to your design, you'd be like, "That's unnecessary. Stop doing that." Um, mm -hmm. But let's take a uh, the first thing that if you notice, this is here the color sequence down here on the right. Um, the Original design had four colors in the sequence. Mine has seven. And so that goes to, again, breaking up the design to make sure that uh, a section sews, you sew the outline. Because the typically the, the registration problems are going to be between the, the fill, the fill not now that it's a fill stitch, but when I say a fill color, it's kind of the whole body of the design. Kind of like if you're just looking at line dart, you have something colored in. Like if you're coloring in a coloring book, you have the fill colors, and then you have that outline, which typically is yeah. you know kind of a black outline. So you have your fill colors, and then you have your detail. Um, so I like breaking that up to make sure that it it does kind of a section at a time. Now you can go crazy and and say, well, I'm going to do the bottom of the boat, the middle of the boat, the top of the boat. Again, going overboard when you start adding you know, 10, 11, 12 different color changes, you are going to slow down your production because it, you know, it takes 30 seconds or whatever for a trim and a color change on your machine. So yeah, in a long run, it may add some production time, but again, um, working production for many years, digitizing for many years, I kind of, I've kind of had that brain for, for the balance to say, okay, let's get it to be the best possible product and best possible runtime on your machine. So, mm -hmm. yeah. um, so let's kind of take a look at my design here. We're gonna run yeah. through it. So, like I said, um, lollipop. <laughs> so the uh, I did opt to go to the the color of the hat. As you can see, the I chose a, a khaki color here because the sample hat was khaki. But as you can see. Um, Actually, I was talking to somebody the other day about this technique of, of kind of using that spiral. I've been using it a little bit more lately. Um, it seems to be working well, but as, if you can see the, the verticals going left and right, that's pretty much the staple. Uh, I like adding this light zigzag when it comes to circular shapes. Um, it, it kind of stabilizes that overall arc of a circle a lot better than just kind of, of just doing the inside of it. Uh, I've, I've seen that that kind of combats um, that kind of egg shape that you get on a circle because the, the stitches are going to want to push up and kind of distort that circle. So mm. um, that is something that I use as kind of kind of an extra edge to that to that area. Do you guys have any thoughts on using that light zigzag versus uh, uh, Tatami style? Do you, do you find any advantage to the to the angularity of the zigzag versus the the parallel component? you know i've i was taught this i saw it in a design once that um before i was digitizing and someone used on a circular design so i adopted it and it seems to work so ah. i've i've never I'm changed not, it. i'm not sure what that underlay is in welcome because i don't have welcome so i'm not sure what like uh um, that like that satin here uh-huh it's it's basically just a, a really light density satin. It's it's in an arc oh, around the, the perimeter around that edge. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So again, um, I did the the global underlay. That's going to secure your your hat to the to the stabilizer. So now, uh, hopefully, the the movement of that hat is going to be real minimal, if any. Um, and then what that's going to do is going to give you that surface that's that's a nice stable surface for the rest of it to, to sew on top of. So, and, uh, Is there a particular length of stitch you like to use for your global underlay? Uh, I tried not to go too small of a stitch. Um, yeah. I used 4.5 millimeters. Yeah. And the reason I asked that is because I think that's a good point is that, um, sometimes we don't talk about, like what settings we use, mm -hmm. but there's a reason to use that longer stitch length, you know, and that global underlay. Um, and so length equals loft, 
longer that stitch, the more the stitches coming after it are going to float mm -hmm. on top and mm -hmm. not fall into the fabric. So yeah, yeah. If 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 you look at it as a, a shorter stitch length means that there's going to be more needle penetrations, and and the shorter the stitch length, those needle penetrations being that much closer, you're basically driving those stitches into the surface of your material. So you're not really giving it that much loft. So what DJ is saying is, is the longer stitch length, that, that longer stitch that's sitting on top of your material, that's going to help your top stitches sit on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the first break apart, as far as the, the, the color changes that I did, of course, I added that color change with the global underlay. Um, I did do the, the background first. Um, I know technically that kind of goes against the the bottom up theory uh, but when it comes to designs that kind of have a large fill area especially those circular designs i opt to kind of do the the most outer part of the design first um, especially depending on how that that design is layered uh, how it should look i try to stabilize kind of the the outer parts of the design first yeah, I always say looking at a design dimensionally, what would be the closest to you and furthest back? Exactly. Right? So by exactly. using that global underlay, you're stabilizing it to where now you can go a little bit in a different sequence because you've already kind of stabilized that cap. Exactly. And now you're able to yeah. approach it a little bit more like a left chest, although you still will do it a little bit different, but it just kind of helps with that. And exactly. And once I kind of, I gave that global underlay, I did use the background as, as your, as your main fill, because it is the, the furthest back element. Um, but that gave me the opportunity to kind of restructure the, the boat area where I was mm -hmm. doing the, the bottom up. And I was, if you, if you look at it, the sew sequence is kind of going uh, out one way, out another way, out one way, out another way. So it's not all pushing one direction. Yeah. Kind of pushing it one, pulling it back. Exactly. Kind of pushing that way, come down, push out that way, come to the left, or come to the left side of it, push out that way, and up to the top of the boat. Yeah. And so as you can see here, it's not going to be doing the uh, entire outline first. I'm doing just the boat section as far as the silver section. Um, again, kind of doing section at a time to ensure that registration. I very well could have kind of broken this top side part of the boat into its own section so do the the main body of it and then come back and then the top side it's going to ensure it that much more uh but i i felt that the the size of the design it was it was able to kind of stick to that area again um didn't have to re-digitize the elements i just kind of resequenced them i did the bottom red half of the boat came back and did the eyes and the mouth and then just finished it off with the the bottom outline so I like that. I like that. So, yeah, some, so, some simple changes. Um, something that's kind of unseen here is the way, it, like we all we all know, inside out, bottom up, but that can be repeated. Like mm -hmm. you, you can start you like your your rearmost fill there, uh, the background fill, start at the bottom, work your way up, and then come back again. Right. Start at the bottom, work your way up. And then come back, you know, and finish the finish the third stuff off. It um, you don't have to do the complete design inside out, bottom up, because you're just going to wind up with this mishmash of elements that don't look. It's going to look like one of those like Eschler's diagrams where the water's running uphill and downhill at the same time. <laughs> exactly. I saw that there was a uh, question of how many trims in the design. There is 15 trims. 15 is healthy. Yeah. Yeah. But that's how you get those little bitty dots and things like that. Yeah. And I mean, you have right off the bat, you have uh, you have one, two, three, four, five, six trims because it's just the color changes. So yeah. um, the actual sew is going to, of course, be the, the additional trims in there. Mm -hmm. There are some sections where, um, yeah. I very well could have if I if I did redigitize this whole thing. Um, I think in between where that top of the flag is and the gray, and then that um, there could have been a pathing stitch from that 
top part of the gray before the flag area and then ran up to that but yep so yeah and you know i'll, I'll say so i know that those are thin satin stitches right and um the one thing that if you choose to do a pathing stitch in that area it's a good idea to use a short stitch length in that case so that it will drive down into, into the stitches and prevent it from popping out exactly uh yeah that's that's a very good point that's that's um quite a bit of time we see posts in our group and, and i've seen them in other groups um on hats they're saying why does it look like there's stitches hanging outside of my yeah. my fill stitches or my satin stitches yeah. especially um, with foam foam edges comes yes. up yes yes so um rule of thumb when it comes to underlay stitches i never use edge walks when it comes to hats edge walks being the the it kind of it walks around the perimeter of your satin stitch um and because it is so close to that edge again the shifting of the hat you are going to have it where when it comes back and does that top stitches it may not cover that that edge walk completely it happens more more on hats than flats i will use edge walks when it comes to to flat goods uh never on a hat um and like dj said stitch length um i know a lot of people just focus on oh what density what density what density stitch lengths make a world of difference as well especially mm -hmm. when it comes to underlay yep. you have a, a stitch length of three four millimeters that's that's you know leaving those longer stitches underneath now there's that little bit more of that play that it may be sticking out left to right under under these thin satins i remember we went deep into that on the tiny text live we did yes. a, a while back you really um, have to be careful with that with yeah it's it's the same principles yeah, yeah. Yep. and there's a lot of times where <clears throat> you get in you start getting really deep into the to the the settings that you can adjust when it comes to underlay stitches you know not only the stitch length but there's something called cording and that's how how much it kind of stutter stops around corners or around curves mm -hmm. to make sure yep. you have those short stitches so even even a good uh, stitch length, say one and a half millimeters that you're keeping a little bit smaller to make sure that it stays underneath the, the satin stitches. But when it goes yeah. around a curve and you get the cording, uh, uh, settings correctly, it actually is going to start doing a little bit less than, uh, uh, a millimeter and a half and, and kind of have a little bit closer stitches, shorter mm -hmm. stitches to make sure that it does go around the curve and not stick out at points. Yeah. Yeah, it's easy to forget that we're trying to make all of these designs and all of these patterns with little itty bitty toothpicks. Exactly. Every 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 penetration to penetration is a straight line, mm -hmm. and and we gotta we gotta try to make corners with this stuff. So it's yeah, it, it's it's easy to forget that we are we are stuck to what we can do with straight lines. Exactly. Yeah, it's. You know, I, I love it because Justin, you digitize the old school way, right? <laughs> and yes, but, but the thing is, is what I've found over the last twenty years is that as software makes things easier and easier, the dumber we get, right? As digitizers, because we start trying to rely on tools alone without understanding stitch lengths. Like that's why I brought it up a couple times is like, mm -hmm. that's so important. You know, like mm -hmm. we use the longer stitch length at the beginning, yeah. but if you're doing one of the pathing stitches, you're going to use a shorter stitch length. It's those little details are what separates a digitizer from a master digitizer, right? Exactly. Like in the getting the results, you know, uh, mm -hmm. a clean back as clean as you can get it. Um, simple things like where you lock your stitches and where you choose to yeah. do the trims, you know, like you can't have them all coming to an end in one section or else you're going to get a lot of problems, right? It's just understanding yeah. the simple and they're, they're kind of the basic things. They were more basic back mm -hmm. in the day. They really were paid attention to, but now with software automating things, we tend to ignore those simple basic mm -hmm. that we all need to pay attention to. Yeah, because yeah. they really do make all the difference in the world and how the design comes out. Yeah, exactly. Um, like you said, I I, I guess I, I do digitize old school, and that's it's a lot of it's manually the way I do things. Even though 
you know, Wocom and Pulse and all these softwares out there are are pretty powerful and they're starting to add a lot yeah. more elements and, and things that are automated. Um, but like you said, there is some times where it's it's automated and there's only so much that this software will will compensate for. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so I using the softwares and again, there's some times where I may see uh, find a bell, bell or whistle in the software that I had, had no idea that it did. I'm like, oh, that's kind of useful. But I, I've I've used the software long enough to where I can say like, okay, these are the things that I know it does well. It's not going to affect the design. It'll speed up my process, and I'll use those automated uh, automated functions or or settings. Um, yeah. But otherwise, I you know I have templates saved as far as what I'm going to use as far as densities and stitch lengths and all that for 3D puff designs. I have you know settings that I'm going to use for for hat designs, and and that's kind of a base that I always use. And then from there, I say, okay, is there any extraordinary instance that I need to think about here. Like for instance, this is an unconstructed hat. And that's why a lot of people, you know, they look at my order form, they're like, oh man, you you asked so much information on your designs. It's like, well, if you want it to run properly, I need to know that information. Uh-huh. Um yep. you know, just not just it's running on a hat. Yep. Okay. Yep. Unconstructed, constructed, Richardson, bucket hat, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that bad word. There's not a one design. There's not a one design fits all. I was just doing a seminar like last weekend. I don't know. I've been on the road way too much, but (laughs) it was just like I I tried to hit that point home is like every design is digitized for a specific type of material. Yep. When you're that's why a digitizer asks you what you're gonna put on. If they don't ask you, you need to find somebody else. Right. Right. Because you know, it's just one of those things you have to know um, what you're going to be putting that design on to. Yep. And you have to adjust the sequence of sewing or the underlay, the densities, all those things come into play based on the fabric. It's all mm-hmm. based on the fabric. Everything we do, the decisions we make are literally based on the fabric itself. Right. And if and if they come back to me and they say like, oh, this is going on an unconstructed hat and it's going on X, Y, Z. If I if I think that I can give you one design that's going to work on all those, then I'll just give you one design and say it's going to work on all of them. But if I say like, okay, I'm going to give you a hat and a chest version because the the size that you're asking for it needs to be a little bit smaller on a hat, so the size difference it may be digitized, the sequence just a little bit differently. Um, you know, I. I typically, if it's not completely having to redigitize a section or it's completely different, I'm not going to charge an additional fee to say, hey, here's a file that's going to work best on a hat. This is going to be work best on a, a dry fit shirt or whatever it may be. Yeah. Uh, but that information is definitely um, pertinent information yeah, for I your mean, digitizer. And there's an order, right? Like, so if they're going to put on a left chest and a hat, it's the same size, you're going to digitize it for the hat. Right. And it's probably going to be just fine on this shirt. But exactly. You can't do it the other way around. Exactly. Expect to get good yeah. results. Yeah. Let me grab a couple of uh, comments here. I think we're a little bit behind. Um, Cindy's saying that hooping and constructing hats are not easy. I agree. It gets frustrating sometimes, depending on the brand. Um, the Gen 2 cap hoop. I've seen these. I've never experienced working with these, um, but they. I've heard that they are a good hat, hat yeah. hoop to, to use. Yep. Um, I'm sure type of Gen 2. Mine is buried in, in ZSK. Structured hoops fast. Unstructured. unstructured. You have to fiddle a bit. Uh, okay. Yeah. The... The the Gen two that they're talking about it's uh, it's like the mighty hoop of Capland. Um, yeah, okay. It's it's the three hundred dollar per frame kind of deal. Like they're 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 very well designed and they and they do make certain things easier and they hold a hat more secure. Are they necessary? Uh, you know, in my opinion, not really. Um, they, they can solve problems, uh, you know, just like mighty hoops can, but you can get away without them too. Um, right. you know, that's, that's not a slight against them. Uh, you know, absolutely. If they're in your budget and they solve enough problems for you, go ahead and buy them. They, they are a superior product. Um, exactly. but they're, 
they're not necessary to fix a lot of these issues. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not a must to run unstructured yeah. hats. Yeah. Uh, Cindy is asking what the lollipop was. So let me show her really oh. quick. Yeah, I like the lollipop. Lollipop is that swirl to start your... Uh, yeah. And that, all that's doing is just helping the fabric, not pulling it to one specific side. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's going around in that circle and started down at the bottom. Yep. And worked up. Another yeah. thing I wanted to mention too, uh, center out. Um, that yes, of course, that is saying going from your center of your hat to the side, center out to the side. But you never want your starting point. This is your zero here. If you can see. I'll bring this down to the you don't want that on the seam. <laughs> you here's your center point right here. If you can see this guide, and you can see this little green diamond is my start point. Yeah. That is off of your center point. You do not want to start that center point in the seam. Why? You're gonna have your your lock stitches or your tie-in stitches at the beginning of the design. You don't want your little small tie-in stitches to be right on top of that seam especially if you're working with a dreaded Richardson 112 that have seams that seem like they're 17 layers thick. So, uh, yeah, you definitely always want to stay, uh, start that, that center point a little off either side to your, to your center point. Yeah. So drop, drop that first stitch on, on friendly turf. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, fr friendly the thinnest turf you possibly can and then yeah. once it starts going then you can start crossing over over your um your seam so uh let's see suzanne said it's funny how you mentioned something now and it brings us home to the point we're making a few months ago yes we we're talking about the small lettering and the, mm -hmm. and the underlay and barbara agreed with you with something about dj said uh yeah how does that theory work for stock designs? I'm sorry, we we're so far behind. I'm not sure what you're referring to, Ramona. So I think it was she was talking about digitizing for fabric. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. um, that's that's where stock designs. The only drawback with stock designs are um, kind of the the, the downfall of them. You know, yep. When I I know I, I have some stock designs on my site that I sell. Um, I try to digitize them in a way that pretty much like DJ said, I'll digitize them if they're a size to, to fit on a hat, I'll digitize them for a hat. And 99.9% .9 of the time, it's going to work on a shirt. Yeah, it's. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest problem comes with stock designs is that most of them are designed for woven fabrics. And so mm -hmm. it's like when you, I look at the settings more closely if the design is going to go on to a knit because that's typically where you'll run into problems with stock designs mm -hmm. is when you start putting them onto knit fabrics. Yeah. 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 Like if, if you were to take a design that's a stock design and then you're like, I have this really thick piled towel or a beanie that has a really, really open weave to it more than likely. I mean, there's some things that you can do to combat that, but more than likely, the density is not going to be as much. The underlay is not going to be, you know, sufficient or whatever it may be. So, um, yeah. yeah, there there are those little drawbacks of stock design. So, yeah. uh, but if you if you have a system where you um, like, I I I think Wilcom is a pretty powerful editing system on top of digitizing. So, you know, if you have a system like Wilcom and you know that know how. You could go in there, even though it's, you're not working with a native EMB file, there is ways of going in there and increasing the density on fills and stuff like that. So if you have the know-how and, 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 you're, and you're working with a good base and you have a good um, stock design from the start, those little adjustments may may work for you. Have we done an hour on that, Justin? Take a, take a DST into something like Wilcom or any of the other ones? And... I think Jeff and I did a while back, maybe last year sometime, yeah. Uh, general question about digitizer digitizing when you supply a file do you make a recommendation about the needle size or thread weight i don't ex unless i'm specifically digitizing like really really small lettering for 60 weight thread um but i found that like you know p 
people even question like the the Madeira colors that I that I choose in the designs. I don't know what your library has as far as colors are concerned. I don't know what brand you have. Um, I don't know what needles you typically keep on hand. And there's a lot of times where if I feel like something needs to be 60 weight thread, um, those that keep 60 weight thread on hand typically only keep it in white and black. They're not going to keep it in all their colors. Yeah. Um, so yeah, right. there is there is times where I say, hey, this really, really small detour, this really small, uh, small text is going to work best with 60 weight thread. Is that something that you that you have or you're willing to get? Yeah, and I was just going to say, like, the more that you can provide to the digitizer, the better. Um, like, if you know that it's going to be really small and you do have 60 weight thread and you have it in the color that they're going to do, tell them that. Right. Because a lot of times they're they're going to probably assume you don't have it. And they're going to just do it in a 40 weight as opposed to a 60 weight where you might get a better result by using the 60 weight. Um, Maybe that's one of the things we need to do is like um, one of these on how to talk to a digitizer about the design, like in and what things you can provide them with information that might not normally be thought of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, might be a might be a good uh, kind of a checklist to kind of have yeah yeah you know, statistically most of your stuff's going to be 40 weight thread 75 11 needle but and i do have those few customers that and yeah. they're specifically they they know they recognize when uh you know what typically it's really small lettering that that people are going to want to use the smaller yeah. thread or the yeah. 60 weight thread and the smaller needles but i do have a couple cu- uh, customers that say hey let me know if you think any of these elements need to be 60 weight thread. So I know right off the bat, okay, they've got mm-hmm. 60 weight thread. And, yep. and, and so, um, of course, those elements I will put on their own color sequence because, of course, you're not going to want to change a needle out in the middle of a, of a color. Um, so I'll notate on the design, you know, this is 60 weight thread. It's going to be in its own color sequence. So, you know, you can de- designate that that needle on your machine to the 60 weight thread. So which i'm sure a lot of people do i did i always had needle one and two were always my 65 nine needles and mm-hmm. they were ready for yeah the 60 weight and only changed them if i needed the extra sequence yeah right and in in you know from the alternative standpoint in my shop you know my multi-heads are nine needle machines i'm not going to waste two on oh, 60 yeah. weight so yeah, that would forget be. it if it can't be done with 40 weight then we're doing something different. We we kind of lean towards that way too as well. We we try to keep everything as far as our standard 7511s and 40 weight thread. Um, if there is that special project and mm-hmm. you know it is worth our time, um, then we will go ahead and make that change. So you guys are lucky to do it all the time. <laughs> I'm doing small lettering. Yeah. I like your global underlay. Recently did a batch of unconstructed hats and was quickly missing my Richardson 112s. Oh, someone <laughs> that actually likes 112s. That's a rarity. Compared to an unstructured hat? Yeah. Every yeah, day. Ex- exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, or instead of the old Tropo, Tropo 60 weight. I never heard of that one. That's a brand I'm not familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of fun having it on hand. Not necessarily, but fun. Uh, we have, we keep three needles per head on our six head, 15 needle for 60 weight, black, white, have and orange. Have you ever used 80 weight? Oh my God. Are you, other than a bobbin? <laughs> yeah. No. No. Yeah. It's kind of fun with small lettering. I do. Well, yeah. 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 You can get so it's super crisp. <laughs> I'd love to give it a shot. I should, I should experiment with it. Um, yeah. That sounds like a side so, by side. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that might be something that we can get into one of these uh, coming weeks as far as, you know, the different weights of threads and how they react to to fabrics and how you digitize differently for them. Um, I'll let DJ talk about digitizing for 80 weight because I've never done it. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it uh, doesn't look like there's any other questions. I'm glad that uh, we were able to help Charlotte out on this design and that she was willing to have us uh, showcase it today and talk about it. 
Um, but yeah, yeah if, you, if you ever have a problem with the design that you have done, of course, I would talk to your digitizer about it. You know, there's times where they may, you know, miss the mark on, on a certain garment or uh, maybe the information wasn't there and you, and you use a design that, you know, originally was done a certain way, but a month later you're going to a new garment. Um, of course, I would suggest going to your digitizer first. But if you are having problems with a design, a stock design, an old design, or, or something that your digitizer is just not getting right, definitely let us know in the group. Uh, you can shoot us an email. Um, Matt and Jeff are always the great ones on the links. But uh, if you if you look through our group, you're going to see the links that's going to yeah. show all our links to get a hold of us. So one way or another, whether you're, you're hitting us up, you know, chatting with one of our, our admins or mods in the group, let mm -hmm. us know and we'd be we'd be happy to help you out we'll showcase another design on on the live on tuesday so yeah yeah charlotte i don't know if we we missed it in the in the group or or not but if you happen to post a picture of the corrected final stitch out uh love to see that if uh, if you haven't already posted it you can drop it into the comments on the on the live she be did actually let me see if oh I well it. hey let me see if That's I can awesome. find it before we go here. That's awesome. I think she did. It's always nice to get the closure. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe not. I thought she did, but maybe not. Yeah. Well, yeah. If, you, if you're able to, Charlotte, if you're at Liberty too, please, we'd, we'd love to see the, the final stitch out. Yeah, yeah, shoot it up uh, in the post in the group. Say, is the picture of the final final hat? I know she did. I just, I don't know where it is right now, but um, maybe, if, maybe if I find it, I'll, I'll post it as well. So, okay. but uh, thank you for everybody for joining us and thank you for uh, Mike joining us tonight and, and DJ. And uh, everybody have a wonderful evening. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.